I figured that I would start tonight with a controversial statement that's probably going to divide the room. That's always a good place to start, I figure. So uh, here it is. I think that Costco is vastly overrated. I, I, I admit it. I think that it is. Anybody with me on this? Show of hands in the room. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, who, who disagrees? Who's like wanting to have a conversation with me afterwards? Okay. I feel that. Yeah. Pretty much 50-50 on it. Um, Here's the thing, is that basically for as long as I can remember, I've been hearing about how great this place is. Like I remember being in middle school, normal conversation for middle school students often isn't what their favorite superstore is, but I remember from middle school, kids talking about the free samples that Costco has and how awesome that they were. I remember high school, all of the kids with the best snacks at their house, uh, their parents all shopped at Costco. Meanwhile... I was a poor little kid whose parents were at Sam's Club. Uh, nobody talks about Sam's Club, right? I mean, I feel like nobody ever talks about Sam's Club. But, um, but my parents shopped there. Um, and then all the way into my young adult years, uh, all the time, you know, hearing guys that are like, yeah, you know where I got this polo? Costco. This is Kirkland. Uh, guys are always talking about it. So a couple years ago, uh, my wife and I, we decided, hey, we're going to bite the bullet. We're going to get the Costco membership, which is already strike one. I shouldn't have to pay you a membership fee to shop at your store. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but regardless, I was still giddy. I was excited about it. I was anticipating great things for my Costco visit. And yet, as we began to walk the aisles of the store, what was anticipation and excitement slowly led to disappointment. See, I realized that uh, a lot of the things that Costco offers, I really don't want, I really don't need. Uh, I was actually looking online yesterday. Uh, they've got a list of items online. They call them the unexpected items. Uh, and they've got things like diamond necklaces. They've got things like uh, solar panels. They've got things like literal barns that you can buy from Costco, apparently. I, I'm like, I don't really need these things. And the things that I did need that I showed up for, uh, the quantities were like way too big for me. Uh, so as we walked the stores, you know, I was expecting to leave with this awesome haul of great things. I think that we walked away with like one box of like 128 granola bars that we're still working on and a slice of pizza. Like, I think that that's it. Um, and so while my expectations, my hopes, my anticipations, they were sky high for this, uh, what I left with was I was basically empty-handed and disappointed. And I got to be honest, I have not returned to Costco since. Uh, <laughs> yeah, some of you are like, yes. Um, why do I tell you that? Uh, why do I go on that rant tonight? Because uh, in a moment, we're going to be looking at a time in the life of Jesus where there's a crowd that shows up, and they have high, high anticipations. They've got great hopes for what's in store. Uh, see, their expectation is that they are going to get something from Jesus. And yet, what happens is that uh, as they go through this conversation with Jesus, the expectations of the crowd, they crash into the offering of Jesus. And slowly but surely, they, they start to think that maybe this whole Jesus thing is overrated. Uh, see, what we're going to look at tonight is that, uh, is that the crowd is going to come to Jesus, and they're going to, to be hoping and wishing to get something from him. And yet, uh, by the end of it, empty-handed, uh, they're going to, some of them, never return to him. But unlike my Costco experience, what I believe to be true of this crowd is that they came face to face with the most satisfying, ultimate, awe-inspiring, amazing thing in all of existence, and yet they simply missed it because their hopes, their expectations, their anticipations, uh, they were just off. They were so concerned with their own agenda that they missed Jesus for who he was. And my hope, my prayer for us tonight is that we do not do the same, that, that we don't miss Jesus. All of us are walking in here tonight with hopes and anticipations of what tonight might bring and what Jesus might have to offer us. And yet my hope is that we simply are able to lay those things aside and take Jesus for who he is tonight. And so if you've got your Bible, you can turn to John chapter six. And as you turn there, let me just catch you up to speed with uh, kind of what's happening on the scene. 
See, Jesus, he's just performed one of his most famous miracles. It's actually the only miracle which is recorded in all four of the gospel narratives. What we see is that Jesus, he's near the Sea of Galilee up on a mountain, and he sees a large crowd gathering in his presence. Uh, uh, scripture uh, head count is about 5,000 men, uh, not including women and children. And so uh, a group of like 10 to 15,000 people gathering on the shore. And as they're coming to them, as they're coming to Jesus, he recognizes that they need something to eat. So what he does is he procures about five loaves of bread and two fish, and he has his disciples sit them all down, he gives thanks and they disperse to all people in attendance. And, and there's so much left over that, that there's 12 baskets full of leftover flakes of bread. And, it, and it's something, it's a miracle. Honestly, I can't even begin to comprehend how that was possible. And so the crowd, what do they do? They, they lose it. They, they lose their mind. They're, they're so excited about what they just witnessed that they would say that, uh, it says this in uh, verse 14 of chapter 6, that when they saw what he had done, they said, indeed, this is a prophet that has come into the world. They're literally about to take Jesus by force and make him king whenever he disappears. He, he disappears into the night. And, and the, the crowd... They, they, the next day, they're looking everywhere for him. Uh, like the crowd has not settled down the next day. Uh, they're, they're looking on the shore and they begin counting boats and they realize, hey, the math, it ain't mathing. And so Jesus, he must not be here. Maybe he took a boat to the other side of the sea. Side note, he actually walked uh, to the other side uh, of the sea. But, but they're like, maybe he's on the other side. And so they get into the boats and they go to the other side. They're in a frenzy looking for him. And this is where we pick up our story tonight in verse 25. It says this. It says, on, uh, it says that when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. The first point for us tonight is that Jesus, he wants our faith, not our fanfare. Jesus wants our faith, not our fanfare. See, so the crowd, they cross the sea and they finally get to Jesus. And, and as Jesus receives the crowd, you'd expect maybe he's like gonna be welcoming to them. He's probably excited to see them. I mean, maybe he's a little bit flattered of the distance that they went. I mean, for me personally, I know that um, like my head gets big when somebody just like compliments my shoes. Like I, I'll be smiling at my shoes the rest of the day if somebody compliments them. Uh, and so I know that if there was a crowd that was seeking after me, uh, that I would probably do anything that I can to try to keep them around. But this is not the way of Jesus. See, Jesus immediately responds to them and says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. See, the response of Jesus, it's not one of rejoicing. It's one of confrontation. And Jesus, he's not interested in just amassing crowds just for the sake of it. He's not interested in the numbers game. He's not trying to promote his popularity. He doesn't get insecure with a few faithful followers. In fact, he's not even paying attention to the numbers at all. What he's looking at with this crowd is their motivation. He's looking right at their motivation, and he knows that they're not there because of signs. Signs, what are they? Uh, well, Scripture throughout the Gospels, especially the Gospel of John, it refers to signs, and really it means a demonstration of the glory and the mystery of God, which points to the true identity of Jesus. But they're not there because of signs. They're not there because they witnessed the glory of God. No, they're there because they just got a free meal. 
And I was thinking about this idea that, that as Jesus, uh, he verbalizes the motivation back to this crowd. Like, what if, what if God did the same thing to us when we came to him? Like, like what if whenever we showed up um, to God seeking him, that, that we were able to, to hear and be called on our motivation? Uh, would it be like, hey, I'm so glad that you desire to meet with me uh, and, and that you would desire to enjoy my company today? Or would it sound something like, hey, you're not here with your Bible open for me. You're here to check off some religious activity and feel better about yourself. Would you say that, hey, you're not here at this young adults gathering for me. You're here uh, to meet somebody. Would he say that, hey, you're not here praying for me to meet with me. You're here because you want my favor. You want the, the job. You want the promotion. Uh, you want to, to make the mess that you've made just simply go away. What would it sound like if God called us on our motivation? The truth is that, that God, he always is aware of our motivation more than we are aware of it ourselves. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, uh, the Lord, he's saying this. He says, for the Lord sees, not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks on the hearts. See, Jesus, he doesn't care for our religious fanfare, no matter how devoted it might look in the moment, no, no matter how inspiring it might look to those around us. He doesn't look at that. See, Jesus knows that our fandom rises and falls. And we know this as fans of Houston sports, right? We know that our, our fanfare rises and falls. Uh, any of you in here Houston Texans fans? Yeah, you weren't until this year. I promise you that. Uh, you weren't until this year. Um, we have suffered for years with the Houston Texans. We've forgotten about them. We've put them out of our memory. And then the minute that they start playing well, we're like, we're on it. We're on the bandwagon. I'm included in that. Uh, and so we know that our fandom rises and falls. Even the Houston Texans quarterback, C.J. Stroud, he, he said this in an interview whenever they were asking about uh, him being in the MVP conversation this year. He said, just like they love me this week, they'll hate me the next. And he knows that. C.J., we'll always love you, though. We'll, we'll always love you. Hear that from me. Uh, but, but he gets it. Uh, he knows that that fandom, it rises and falls based on circumstances. But Jesus, he wants our faith. See, Fanfare is fixed on circumstance, but faith, it's driven by character. Uh, it doesn't rise and fall on our current perception of what God is doing for us, but it's rooted in a deep idea of who God fundamentally is. We see Jesus call the crowd to this kind of faith in verse 29, where he says that this is the work of God, to believe in him who he has sent. And then over the course of this passage, he repeats himself over and over again, either calling them to faith or challenging their existing belief. Six times he mentions their belief. But this belief, it's not just simply in, I believe generally in the existence of Jesus. No, we see actually in verse 36 that Jesus challenges them again. And he's saying, hey, I've said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. And it, so seeing, it's not always believing, right? It was possible for these people to be in the very presence of the Messiah, of God in the flesh, and for them to be totally oblivious to who they were in the presence of. And, and the same thing, unfortunately, is true for us today, right? Like, like there's some of us in here where we've been around like the, the Jesus thing for a long time. Like we've been in and out of churches. And so we've seen and we've heard of who this Jesus is. And yet we've never actually believed in him. Like we've never actually put our faith in him for the forgiveness of our sins and the welcoming of new life. And so there's some of us where we've been around, we've seen, but we've never actually fully believed. And then there's some of us, I would say that, that we have um, been around for so long that we've seen Jesus for so long that we've just grown desensitized to him. Uh, that that um, you've seen so much of him that he's just become 
old news to you. Like you're pretty sure that, he's exist, that he exists, but his relevance to you, it's, it's just grown stale. See, that you might believe or, or, or think, yeah, there's, there's this guy that's named Jesus that lived a long time ago, but, but you don't understand that, that his character is wildly relevant and accessible for you even tonight. The faith that Jesus calls us to is one that believes that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he alone is all satisfying, all sufficient. And this takes us to verse 30. Uh, I'll read verses 30 to 35. It says this. So they, they asked him, then what sign must you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus replied and he said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And so let's review what's going on here. So first, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Crowds go wild. They come seeking after him. And when they make it across the sea, he challenges their motives and then calls them to believe that he has been sent by God. And now their response is, prove it. Like, give us something to believe in, which kind of sounds odd. Like, isn't that why they chased him down in the first place? Didn't they witness something which called them to follow? And yet, what, uh, what's true for them is that this is something like Jesus' sign in the beginning of John 6. It was, in their mind, maybe a sign of more things to come, right? During this time, that uh, it says at the beginning of chapter 6 that this was the Passover. And so the Jewish community over this period, they'd be reading the scriptures. They'd be familiarizing themselves with the departure of Israel from Egypt in their flight to the desert. So this idea of manna or bread from heaven, it would be fresh on their mind. And so as they're looking, they're comparing in their minds the, the miracle of Jesus to that of Moses. And they're saying, okay, well, Jesus, you gave us bread from earth, enough to feed 5,000 for one day. And yet what they look at as they look back to the Old Testament in their minds, they're saying, hey, but, but Moses, he gave a whole nation, over a million people, bread from heaven for 40 years. So is that, is that all you can offer? Is there more to come? And so while they've seen something, they come to Jesus and they're saying, hey, show us more. It, like, we want more. This isn't enough to prove that we should believe in you. And so as, uh, although that they've already received, they come again wanting something from Jesus. But Jesus, he wants to reframe their search, which takes us to our second point tonight, that Jesus is determined to become what we need, not simply give us what we want. Jesus, he's determined to become what we need, not just give what we want. And you hear this distinction happen at the end of verse 34, beginning of verse 35, where they say, hey, give us this bread always. And Jesus' response is, I am the bread. Like, I don't need to give you anything more because I am the bread. See, Jesus, he doesn't want to just settle with giving us bread. He wants to be our bread. They come to him looking for provision, and yet Jesus, he responds with his presence. He wants to give them himself. And so why does Jesus care that we know that we need him? Like, why does that matter to Jesus? I'll give you two reasons. The first is that He's worthy to worship. He's worthy to worship. And when I say worship, what I mean is that uh, he's worthy for us to adore, to, to love, to treasure in our inward being. John Piper, when he's talking about this passage, he would say that Jesus, he wants to be precious, not just useful. 
He doesn't just want to be useful to you. He wants to be precious and valued. And so let me ask you, is Jesus precious to you even when he's not useful? Or is his value in your life only have to do with the times where he's giving you what you want and what you need? My wife is here tonight, Valerie up front, give people a wave. Uh, we call, uh, her friends call her Val, and so you can say, hey Val, hey Val. Um, but uh, we've been married for about four and a half years, and I think that we have finally begun to hit our stride whenever it comes to shared responsibilities around the house. Uh, I do the laundry, another story about that. Uh, I do the laundry, she does the dishes. I do the trash, she does the cleaning in the bathroom. Uh, funny enough, speaking of bread, she makes great sourdough bread, and I eat it. Uh, we've got our duties, we've got our responsibilities around the house. Um, and yet what's true of our relationship is that, that it's not just predicated upon like her being useful to me, right? Like, like you would all shake your head in disgust if I told you, yeah, I come home whenever she's doing the, the, the trash, or not the trash, when she's making the bread, whenever she's cleaning the bathroom, doing the dishes. Uh, that would be a terrible thing. No, uh, I don't value her just because she's useful. I value because she's precious to me. That, that her identity, because of our relationship, is one of supreme value in my life, not tied to just what she does. And so the question for us is not the one that we're so often concerned with, which is, is God going to give me what I want? That's not it. And the question that we should consider tonight is, is, is he worthy regardless? Like, is God worthy? worthy of worship and adoration in my life, regardless of what he does. I think that in our culture, in our generation, we've kind of, we've got this idea that um, there's a lot of different things that we can pursue to kind of get what we want out of life. Uh, there's a lot of theories out there that, hey, maybe it's meditation, or maybe it's self-affirmation. Maybe it's karma. That's how we can get what we want out of life. Uh, maybe it's just, hey, working hard and, and subscribing to the hustle culture. And, and I think that sometimes we can take Jesus and we can kind of put him in that category. Or our culture puts him in that category of like one of many good things which could lead to the end result of, hey, finding contentment and satisfaction out of life and kind of getting what you want. And Jesus should never be put in that category. He's not just some like cosmic vending machine that we can manipulate to get what we want out of life. That's not where he belongs. And if anybody tells you that you can control and manipulate your life by getting a desired outcome, they're lying to you. Whether they subscribe to being a, a Christian or not, like, like we don't control the outcomes in our life. Like I desperately wish that I could stand up here today and promise you that the thing that you're desperate for, God would just do in your life. Like, I, I wish that I could say that to you tonight. I, I wish that I could tell you that, man, 2024, it's going to be your year to find somebody. I wish I could tell you that without a shadow of a doubt that your parents' separation wouldn't end in divorce. I, I wish that I could tell you that that job that you've been trying to get that you, or that you've been trying to get out of for so long would finally come your way. A and yet, I can't promise you that. I, I can promise you, though, that God has your best interest in mind. And I think sometimes we th see that, sometimes we don't. Like, I know I'm grateful for the prayers that sometimes God has said no to in my life. Sometimes I can look back and I can see, man, like your way was so much better all along. And sometimes I'm left wondering. But I know, and I can promise you without a shadow of a doubt, that, that God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I can promise you that we do have a God who hears our prayers and a God who said that he delights to give good gifts to his children. That's his heart. And so when you come to him, you're not just 
bouncing prayers off the ceiling, but he cares for you. He hears you. And I can promise that that I would sit right here and I would pray with you that those things that you desire would be true in your life. Like I would sit as long as it takes to pray prayers of faith, believing that God's sovereign, believing that he's good and praying in faith for what he has for your life. But I can't promise you the end result. I I can promise you though, that there is a God who is worthy to be worshiped no matter what the outcome are in life. Tyler Statton, he he wrote a book on prayer, and he would say this, that we don't have a God that we can fully understand, but we do have one that we can fully trust. See, Jesus, as he says this statement, I am the bread of life. Yeah, he's pointing to, um, he's pointing to the wilderness, he's pointing to manna in Exodus 16, but he's also pointing to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. See, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, what that would trigger in the mind of his listeners is it would take them back to whenever Moses is talking to God in the burning bush and he's saying, hey, who should I say sent me? Whenever I go before the people and I go before Pharaoh, like, who should I say sent me? And God's reply best translated is tell them this, I am sent you, that I am who I am. That's the name of God. And so this name, it represents ultimate sufficiency. Like it it represents ultimate uh, self-existence, the immediate presence of God. And so when Jesus is saying, I am the bread of life, he's tying his identity to those characteristics. I don't know about you, but that is a God that I can't even begin to try to wrap my head around. Like whenever I think about a God that has always been existent, who, is, who has forever been there, who is sufficient within himself, not relying on anybody else, my, my brain, it can't comprehend that. But, but that kind of God, while it might not be one I can understand, it is one that I can stand in awe of that I can worship and I can say, though I don't understand, I I trust you, God. And and this is from the place that in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would stand before King Nebuchadnezzar. and, And King Nebuchadnezzar would say, hey, worship me or I'm throwing you into this furnace. And they would say, hey, our God will surely save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow to you. Because there is only one name who's worthy of worship. It comes from a place of understanding just how big and just how worthy that God is that we realize that we need him more than anything else. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Uh, Paul, he would say that he counts everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Is God, is Jesus precious to you or is he just useful? He's worthy of our worship. But more than that, the second reason that that Jesus wants us to know we need him is because he's enough to enjoy He's enough to enjoy. He is our satisfaction. He is God's provision for us. Like everything that we need has already been provided in Christ Jesus. We see that throughout this passage, Jesus would describe the kind of provision that he is. He would say that the kind of provision that he is is first steadfast. In verse 27, it says, Uh, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. See, there's no expiration date on the provision and the satisfaction that Jesus provides. Secondly, his provision is spiritual. Verse 33, it says, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. See, Jesus, he offers a satisfaction that's deeper than just physical. Uh, We we get our fill today, we're hungry tomorrow. And yet uh, the spiritual fulfillment, it it goes deeper. It's a deeper well of satisfaction. So his 
provision is spiritual. His provision is satisfying. We see in verse 38 that he says, Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Everything else, law of diminishing returns. Like, the more that we come back to something, the less that it satisfies. And yet, Jesus is forever, ultimately satisfying. That he will never not fill us back once again. And then finally, his provision is secure. This is in verse 39, where he says, that This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he's given me, but raise it up on the last day that it's not going anywhere. We don't have to wonder if we're going to lose this provision. Everything else in this life, here today, gone tomorrow. As much as we would like to believe that we have control over our circumstances, we don't. And yet, the provision of Jesus, it's secure. It's everlasting. It's not going anywhere. Do you know anything else like this? No. There's nothing else would check all of these boxes. And when we think about what is that thing that you want most in life, I can promise you this, that, that when it is that you get that, if it's not Jesus, it will not satisfy you. That you'll want the next thing. Show me one person who you would say has got it all and is yet happy and content in life. It doesn't exist. That nobody out there who's gotten their fill of this world will look back and say, yeah, I've got it. Like, I've figured it out. I'm content because I've amassed all of these things. And yet, the person of Jesus is all sufficient and satisfying. He alone is what's going to satisfy us. So nothing that you could walk away with tonight would be better than gaining more of Jesus himself. I believe that. Whatever you walked in wanting, begging God for, like nothing else would be better than just getting more of Jesus himself. He's the key to joy in life. Some of you, you might be saying, but Brandon, like I still kind of feel gypped by that. Like like I still feel like I'm walking away empty-handed here. Um, yeah, like Jesus is, is satisfying, I get that, but are you really telling me that I might go my whole life and not get what I, I, I really want? And my response to that would be, let us not forget our home. Let us not forget our ultimate citizenship. Uh, our citizenship, for those of us that are in Christ, it's, it's in heaven, And I think that so often, like, our Western culture, honestly, I think that we are so close to having everything that we want. We're so comfortable that it's that, like, one thing that will nag at us. And yet, I think that whenever we try to oversupply ourselves of of satisfaction and things to fill up ourselves here in this world, we start to diminish the value and the hope that should be ours in heaven. I think that we forget that, hey, our life here, it's meant to be a war zone. It's not meant to be a luxury resort. Like, like there should be an eagerness and a longing and a joy and a hope for the one day that we'll get to be in the presence of God and then have no more needs. Like, like we're not meant to have that all today. We're, we're meant to long and wait and hope and then one day rejoice when we receive it in heaven. And so I've felt this um, like just kind of a silly example uh, this last weekend. Um, we were walking in Sugarland, um, which I realized today is two words. Uh, it's not Sugarland, it's Sugarland. Um, but we were walking in Sugarland and uh, Going near like some nice houses. I mean, there's like some water out there, these houses on the lake. And, uh, and just having a conversation about like, yeah, like we will never live in a house like this. Like this will never be some, a reality for us. Uh, and I think that like a couple of years ago, that really would have uh, bothered me. Like I think that, that I, I would wrestle with this reality that like, man, that's kind of not fair. Like, like why not? Like why couldn't I get something like that, God? 
Uh, and yet, the, funny enough, like half kidding, conversation was like, hey, you know, while we might not have a mansion today, one day we'll be in our father's house. And there's many rooms there. And, and that should be our attitude, right? That, that all things that first and foremost, Jesus can satisfy here and now. And then we look to eternity, we look to heaven, and we long for the satisfaction and the fulfillment of those things in the physical, what is now in the spiritual. And we can long for those things. So Jesus, he's determined to become what we need because he is worthy and he's enough. Take this to uh, the rest of the passage. We don't have time to, to read the whole thing because of the length. But as Jesus continues the conversation, what we would see through the rest of the passage is that he becomes increasingly more clear about what kind of provision that he intends to offer. Uh, he becomes more and more specific about what he wants to, to grant. And the response of the crowd and the disciples, they become increasingly polarized, that, that they become increasingly distinct as Jesus becomes increasingly specific, which takes us to our final point, that Jesus, unexpected, will either, leave, will either drive you away or draw you near. Jesus, when he's unexpected, he will either drive you away or draw you near. See, the, the logic of the passage, it flows kind of like this. Like Jesus, he gives them earthly bread. Then he begins to talk about heavenly bread. And then he begins to say that he is the bread. And then he begins to say that he is the bread to eat. And then he says that he is the sacrificial bread from heaven to eat. He becomes more clear. And as he becomes more clear, as he like walks further away from the initial expectation of these people that he was going to give them earthly bread, what we see is the response of the crowd and then the response of Peter. Now, the response of the crowd, we see this in uh, verse 60, and then in verse 66, it says this, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? And then in verse 66, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so what we see is that, that while this crowd, it started with celebration and seeking, and then slowly it started asking its questions, and then they started grumbling, and then they started arguing. Where it ends is that even some of his closest followers begin to say, this is a hard saying. Like, this is a tough pill to swallow. And eventually, some fall away in disbelief. So as Jesus moves further and further from what they came for, what they expected, they become more and more agitated and dissatisfied. But then we also see the response of Peter. In the response of Peter, Jesus, he looks at his disciples, and he says to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter, he answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter, he asks that question, whom else would we go to? And Peter, he's still got questions, right? We, we, he's still phrasing it as a question. I, I, I would say based on my interpretation, that, that Peter, he doesn't fully understand what just happened. And yet he would say that, hey, regardless of if I fully understand or not, I can say that I'm going to stand here where you have said there is life. And I'm going to double down with the things that I do know. Although there's things I still don't understand, I'm going to stand on the truth of what I do know, which is rooted in your character, Jesus. I know that, that you have words of eternal life. I know that, that you are the Holy One of God. I may not understand this circumstance. I may not get why it is that you sent these people away without filling them again with bread, but I will say that, that I know you and I'm going to double down my faith on you, Jesus. And so my, my question for us tonight is, which one are you? 
Like when Jesus doesn't do what you expect, do you walk away? Or do you double down on what you know to be true? I was, uh, I was just thinking, like I could not escape this thought over the last couple of days that, that I think that if we were all honest with ourselves in this room, I think far more of us than we care to admit are just disappointed in God. Like I think that we might hide that from people. And yet I, I think that so many of us in here, like we had this expectation of what following Jesus should look like. I think that we've, we've heard stories, we've listened to people talk about, hey, what it is that we can find in Jesus and the great joy and adventure that it is to follow him. And you've just found yourselves in situation after situation where you're just discontent and dissatisfied. And you're like, what I thought you had to offer Jesus, I've not received. Like, like I thought that, that in following you that, that I might get this or attain this or, or that I might find this out of life. And yet you've just found yourself honestly in a place where you're saying, like, is this, is this Jesus thing overrated or not? Like, is it what they've made it out to be? I, I, I hope that if you're in here and that's you, if you're in here and you've thought like, Man, this is hard. Maybe I, should, maybe I should fall away. Maybe I should go. That tonight you would see that in the middle of your wanting, in the middle of what can feel sometimes like disappointment, that Jesus is standing right there in the midst of it. And what he would say to you tonight is, hey, I know what you want like, I know what it, you're after. I know that thing that you feel like if you had it, you'd be satisfied. You'd be content. But it's me that you need. And he's standing there. He's offering himself. He's saying, hey, come and take the bread of life. Every other bread, every other type of provision, it's not going to satisfy you. It's not worthy of your attention and your longing and your hoping. It's only me who can satisfy you. And in the midst of your, your longing, I th think that Jesus tonight, he would just say, hey, would you trust me? Like Peter, even if you don't fully understand, would you just choose tonight to double down? Would you choose to trust me in the midst of circumstances that may not make sense? Would you choose to believe that I am satisfying for you? I am better. See, when Jesus isn't who we expect, one of two things can happen. And that's really what this whole series has been about. That when, when Jesus, who's not who we expect him to be, we can either focus so much on, man, well, why, why isn't he this way? Why isn't who, he who I expected him to be? We can focus on us not getting the thing that we want, or we can see Jesus for who he now is, which is surpassingly and far better than anything which we could ever replace him with. We've got two options. Every time Jesus is unexpected, he puts a fork in the road. So my plea to you tonight is simple. It's like, it's just, would we let go of lesser things and cling to our Savior? This whole passage, underneath it all, Jesus, he wants us to see that it's only through his sacrifice that he can satisfy. It's only through his sacrifice that he can satisfy. Later on in the passage, he starts talking and he's saying, hey, like, you've got to eat, 
eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to abide in me. And it's pretty graphic stuff. But that word flesh in the Greek, what it means is, is really it's flesh offered in sacrifice. And so what Jesus is saying is that, hey, any satisfaction that I can offer you, it's only because of my sacrifice. Like, like we should not be able to have abiding relationship with God because of our sin. And yet he's saying, hey, I could be all satisfying and all sufficient for you for your sins. It's not just that Jesus could satisfy our, our temporal needs, our, our wants right now, but, but with the sacrifice of Jesus, he can also satisfy the wrath of God towards our sins. Like all of us in here, we have sinned and we've fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have looked for satisfaction in lesser things. All of us have turned away from what Jesus has offered and said, no, I'm going to find it in something else. And yet Jesus, through his sacrifice, he satisfied the, the wrath, the punishment, which all of us deserved. And it's through his death that now Jesus can say, hey, come to me. I am the bread of life. His life is only offered through first his death. And so if you don't know that, if you've not had the, the satisfaction of Jesus for you and for your sins, tonight I invite you to take that up, to take it on. He wants to. He's inviting you. Nothing else can replace that which he offers you tonight. Let me pray for us. God, I just remind myself the truth of your word. God, I, I'm here tonight not as a master, but as a student. Lord, all of us in here, God, we need to know that, God, nothing else in this life would ever satisfy us. Jesus, you alone are worthy of our worship and you alone are enough for us to enjoy. Man, I believe that if we knew that tonight at a deep, deep level, everything else in our walks would change. And so God, would you give us the eyes to see God, it can't come from a, a sermon or from a message. God, it is only by your spirit and by your power, God, that you could open our eyes to just how desperately we need you tonight. So God, would you show us the supreme value and worth of Christ Jesus, our Lord, God, and would you show us that all else is rubbish in comparison to the surpassing worth of knowing you. I pray for my friends in the room, God, that, that they do feel disappointed. God, that they have felt hurt by you. They've kind of walked in here with a burden, whether they'd admit it to others or not, that, God, you've not really held up your end of the deal, that they're doing the things and they're showing up, and yet you've not given them that thing which they want so desperately. God, I pray that you would help us see, God, that you are more interested in becoming what we need and that that is for our good. So Lord, we surrender those things to you, God. And then pray for my friends that do not know you. God, that they've, they've been around, God, but they've never known the true satisfaction, God, that, that only you can offer them. God, I pray that, again, through the stirring of your spirit, God, they would see you 
God, as the thing in life that they need most. Nothing else can fill your spot, God. Nothing else can replace you. It's only you who satisfies. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen.